You are watching Tech Talk coming at you from our studios in Zurich. I'm Ana Maria Montero. Lots of tech news this week, namely coming out of Barcelona because you guessed it. It is Mobile World Congress time. It is the world's largest mobile exhibition. And we are joined now by CNN business and tech correspondent Samuel Burke who is there on the ground, surrounded by lots of people there, lots of action. Now, you and I just saw each other in Las Vegas for CES, which was the biggest consumer electronics show in the world. Tell me, how comparable is the Mobile World Congress exhibition to CES, for example, in terms of size and scope? Ana Maria, it's not quite as big in terms of the amount of people that attend, but its geopolitical importance is huge, and quite frankly, because 5G, Huawei, these huge mobile carriers, have become some of the biggest industries in the entire world and are important to the future of many countries, this Congress, this conference, has become really one of the most relevant and important in the world up there with Davos, with the Consumer Electronics Show. And certainly Donald Trump has made these conferences that much more relevant by always talking about 5G, Huawei, the China uh, telephone makers. And in fact, he was just tweeting about 6G a few days ago, so he's already looking to the next Mobile World Congress. That's right. Now, again, I just, I just heard you mention more or less China taking the headlines again, just as it did when we spoke in Las Vegas. Tell me, what is the latest that seems to be coming out? You spoke with the Huawei chairman, as I understand it, just recently. That's right. I spoke to him just yesterday. We had a long back and forth, about 30 minutes. And interesting to see how Huawei is making itself more available to the public now. We've seen the founders speaking out. But what the chairman told me that was really interesting is he said he wants countries to think independently about the use of Huawei. What he is specifically referencing there is the pressure that we've seen, especially from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo of the United States and Vice President Mike Pence. They've been putting incredible pressure, especially on the European allies, to remove this uh, equipment. The U.S. Secretary of State even saying at one point that it would make it much harder to keep the alliances that they have with countries like Hungary, for example, if they use Huawei. So what the chairman said here is, look, again, he repeated that he believes this is politically motivated. And you and I both know the lines have been very blurred for people once the uh, founder's daughter of Huawei was arrested in Canada. Once Trump said that he might consider her freedom as some type of bargaining chip, the whole line between cybersecurity and all of this has been blurred by those statements from President Trump. What I also found interesting was the chairman of Huawei uh, saying really that they're going to push forward no matter what. They want to be the company of choice. They believe that they're 12 months ahead of all the other 5G carriers and frankly, one very, very senior executive, a major telecoms company, told me just today that actually thinks Huawei is much further ahead. So at the end of the day, what this all means is I'm hearing from all these executives who are telling me I don't have an alternative to Huawei in terms of technical capability and in terms of a similar cost. All these executives here are really fearful, Ana Maria, that they spent all this money and they're not going to get the return on investment they, that they'd hoped for. And interesting, there's no other American company that can really do what Huawei is doing. It's mostly Swedish and Finnish companies that would be competing for a space in replace of Huawei in the 5G equipment. Well, and, and speaking of getting uh, a bang for your buck, as you, as you mentioned, and getting a return on the investment, it's one thing that Huawei has been toting this year has been their new foldable phone, which, as I understand it, comes in at about 2,600 U.S. dollars. Now, have you been able to get your hand on one of those? Okay, we thought that people would be talking about the technology more than anything, but just like the Samsung foldable event, they're talking about the price tag more than anything. You're right, the Samsung phone, about $2,000, not including tax. The Huawei phone, $2,600, though that includes tax. A bigger phone than the Samsung device at eight inches when the tablet is folded out. Almost 50% uh, skinnier, much thinner, the Huawei phone than the Samsung device. And at the end of the day, uh, we can't tell you much uh, except for what they've told us, because just like Samsung, they would not let us get our hands on the phone. They wouldn't even let us get our hands on the glass that was surrounding the phone here. We know that Samsung's phone is coming out April 26th. 
Huawei didn't even mention a date for when they're actually not just debuting, but launching their phone, making it available to the public. But we'd certainly like to get our hands on to see just what that fold really is like and see just how much we can get it to bend. Now, one thing you were able to get your hands on, though, was that Microsoft um, HoloLens 2, right? Exactly. This isn't augmented reality or virtual reality. Those terms are very 2018, Ana Maria. They are really focusing on all of these companies calling this mixed reality. I've got to say, this new headset, $3,500. Suddenly that Huawei phone doesn't look so expensive. <laughs> but they're really focused not on the everyday consumer. They're focused on businesses using this at work to help people in construction, in factories, uh, augment their jobs. I think this is why this device has had success because they haven't tried to go very broad. They've followed the money. The device is much lighter than other ones. Sometimes it literally is pulling back my neck when these devices are so heavy. It outweighs the virtual experience because the physical one is so difficult. This one was actually much easier to use. There's a little adjuster on the back so you can make it as snug or not as snug as you want. That allowed me to focus on the experience. A much wider field of view. A lot of times there's all this reality here that's not being augmented. This time you see the field of view much wider so it felt like a much more ex uh, immersive experience and also the ability to push buttons in this virtual world. Now you may say, okay, pushing buttons, I do plenty of that in the real world, but this is a big step for augmented or mixed reality as I should call it because before sometimes you're pushing and you're trying to interact with this uh, this field, it doesn't work. This time it was much more intuitive. You push and sometimes it only took you one try instead of six tries when you're trying to click to get onto the next screen. I saw some really interesting use cases from construction workers looking inside a, a device that they're trying to fix to know where the parts are uh, to the medical field trying to carry out surgeries with this and it allows them to just have an extra layer of tools on a screen in front of what's actually in front of them, the, the actual reality. All right, well, sounds like you got a lot going on there. Mixed reality, foldable phones, and 5G. Thank you, Samuel Burke, as always, for joining us. So as we just saw, 5G is still taking center stage at the World Mobile Congress this week in Barcelona. And here in Switzerland, it has also been making headlines. Just this month, we saw the auction of the 5G mobile frequencies to Swisscom, Sunrise, and Salt for a total of 380 million Swiss francs. But as Switzerland gears up for the rollout of the next generation technology, which is, for all of us, promises faster connections than today's 4G networks, it does raise concerns about security and safety. We're joined now by Philippe Oxlin, CEO of Objective Sécurité, from our Geneva studio. Hello, Hello. Philippe. Thank you so much for joining us today on Tech Talk. You're welcome. All right. So. 5G, in simple terms, will basically allow me to do the same things I've been doing, just faster. Yes, your phone will be talking much faster, transmitting much faster, but also there's going to be other devices using that network. So your fridge might be talking to your car and to your baby camera or, or whatever. Which are all combinations that I, <laughs> I definitely been looking forward to happening, my car with my, yeah. my baby phone, but I guess you never know. Connectivity, anyway, is going to be in the end, uh, that next, what what's, what it's really going to be about, right? Definitely. Much more devices talking together in all places at all speeds. And earlier, we mentioned security because, I mean, 5G could potentially bring, as you said just now, more things together. So more parts of your life are going to be now are potentially intertwined. How, how much more risk does that bring? Those things are already intertwined today over the internet, but now more of that part will be over the air, will be over the radio transmissions. So there must, might be some risk that those transmissions might be uh, intercepted and people look into your communications and try to modify your, your communications. But is there more of a possibility of that happening than what we're happy, having now? I don't now? think so, because mm -hmm. with every generation of those um, networks, they have added some additional security into them. So uh, GSM had some encryption, 3G had better encryption, 4G had better one, and in 5G, they're gonna go, they've gone even one step further to make it even better. Uh, it's still not perfect, there's still holes in it, but it's much better than it was in, in 3G and 4G. So you personally, you feel good about using 5G? Oh yes, definitely.
Okay. And uh, I mean, do you feel like we're, we're ready for it in terms of, of infrastructure, in terms of, you know, I think, I think now about electric cars, for example, you know, the, there are a certain amount of electric cars, but you also need charging stations. You need certain amounts of infrastructure that goes along with it. Are we at a point where we can absorb this new rollout? No, what is going to be needed is new antennas. They will have to build many new antennas to uh, communicate with all those uh, 5G devices. So there is still a, a lot of rollout to do. I guess in the beginning it will be available in the big cities and then it will roll out also into other uh, parts of Switzerland. Okay, speaking of Switzerland, an ongoing discussion here is also about the strict Swiss laws on radiation limits. So um, Swisscom announced plans to cover 60 Swiss towns and communities with 5G technology by the end of the year. But they also flagged that it could be that the regulation on uh, radiation could be a potential showstopper for them. I mean, how, how, how much are you concerned that this could actually delay the rollout? It's... It's just a, qu a question of price. Um, in Switzerland, we are very careful and the, and the limits for transmission power are, are very low, much lower than in other countries. That means that you need to have more antennas which are closer to people so that you can reach them with, with less power. So uh, in the end, it's just a question of how many antennas are they willing to build and how much it's going to cost to build all those antennas. If we could just raise the levels of, of um, transmission power, they could put like fewer antennas which will send much more much higher levels of, uh, of energy to talk to the devices. And here is the ongoing debate because Switzerland has some of the stricter laws in Europe on this. Exactly. Switzerland has been very careful and very cautious. They wanted to have very uh, low levels of, of radiations. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very good. And if we can keep that, that would be good to, to not jeopardize this just because we want to have this new 5G faster and, and cheaper than, than if we didn't have that. And it's also because it's also a part of the public concern. I mean, it's a perception, right? People are concerned about their health and their environment. And am I going to develop it, diseases? I mean, this is not an easy thing to overcome. It's very difficult to communicate to people that what we did before was very safe, but now we're going to have higher levels of transmissions and it's still going to be safe. So um, this is going to be very difficult to, to, to manage. And I think it would be a pity if they would give up on that. And do you think this whole radiation discussion could just, in the end, drive up costs? Yes, I think it's just a question of, of, of costs. You can do it cheaper if you can have a higher levels of transmission power. You can do it with lower levels, but you need more antennas and more, more equipment. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be more expensive and take more time to, to roll out. All right, Philippe, another hot topic this year at the Mobile World Congress and here in Switzerland is Huawei. Now, I've heard it been called a cloud over Switzerland. Why is that? Well, some people are afraid that um, the equipment coming from China, from Huawei, could have some backdoors in it, and those backdoors could be used to spy on, on, on the communications that are going through those uh, equipments. How so probable that's, uh, do you think that, that is? Excuse me, how, how probable? Well, mm -hmm. I think, personally, I think the probability is quite low. I understand where it comes from, because we know that the Chinese government has been doing some hacking and spying in the internet, as have other governments also done. Uh, we know that there have been issues with some equipments regarding um, intellectual properties, for example. So people are afraid that Huawei, which is very close to the Chinese government, will build some spying uh, equipment, spying backdoors into their equipment. Um, I think the chances are very low. For the, uh, as of today, I have never seen any proof of any backdoor in any of those Huawei equipments. So for the moment, they have a clean record. And it would be really, really dumb from them to risk being detected as being spies and then losing all this market. Uh, I understand that there's only three manufacturers in this 5G market. And I think Huawei is, is the one which has the best position. So I think there's more like an economical war going on, fear-mongering to try to give an advantage to other uh, competitors in the market. Okay, so you think it's fear-mongering? I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, people looking for arguments for defending some brands and some types of equipments rather than the other ones. I think you must be cautious and you must not be naive and just give away the, the, the security of the network. But I think our network operators already know that and they already protect their critical infrastructure against any attempts of spying, be it from the Chinese or the American or the French or whoever. Um, so it, it must be protected anyway. And I, I don't think that because of this type of equipment, 
or another brand of equipment, we would have more risks of being spied on. Okay. And just to finish up, Switzerland, as we know, has not answered the U.S.'s call to ban Huawei. So they are even looking to expand here in Switzerland. From what I understand, uh, one of the operators is going to use Huawei a lot, and another one is going to use some of these equipments. Um, Switzerland is in a different position. Um, in the U.S., you can say, we don't want to take any Chinese technology. We'll take just the national technology, local technology, and, and build that. In Switzerland, we have no Swiss manufacturer of 5G networks. So for us, we might be building, we might be spied on either by the U.S. or by the Chinese, and we could have, like, European or Chinese or, or American uh, um, equipment, and it, none of this, in none of those cases, it would be our own equipment where we have the control. So we are in a very different uh, situation, and we have different motivations from using one equipment or another type of equipment. All right. Well, thank you so much, Philippe, for joining us today on Tech Talk and for all of your insights. Very much appreciate it. You're welcome. And to finish up this weekend, we conducted our first ever Tech Talk poll on Facebook, and we asked you whether you thought your phone bill would go up as a result of 5G. And the results are that 64% of you said yes, you expect your phone bill to increase at the end of the month with the onset of 5G, while 36% said no. Now, this, of course, remains to be seen, but what we do know is that change isn't cheap, and these carriers and device makers will have to recoup the costs of the 5G change. So, still lots to talk about. Thank you so much for joining us today on Tech Talk. More to come on the Swiss Pulse, so don't go away. <laughs>